midsummer 1915. The war was almost a year old, a visible thing, a landscape halfway to desolation. It stretched from the flats of Flanders, across the wide plains of northern France, to the mountains of the Vosges and the Swiss frontier. Then through Italy and across Serbia, along the edge of the Gallipoli Peninsula. And miles by hundreds of miles through the Russian steppes to the Baltic Sea. A vast circle of flame and hate. Wherever their armies marched, the Germans seemed to be triumphant. Together with the Austrians, they had summoned up pitiless energy to strike down their enemies in the east. The Battle of Golitsi Tarnov had begun in early May. On June the 3rd, the German and Austrian forces recaptured Peshemisu. On the 22nd, they were back in Lemberg, fourth largest city of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and scene of Russia's great victory in 1914. In two months, the combined German and Austrian armies had advanced 150 miles and had inflicted over half a million casualties on the Russians. It was a moment of triumph for the Central Powers. It produced, said Falkenhayn, the German chief of staff, immediate and highly valuable consequences. But enough had not yet been achieved. It was clear that any breaking off of the operations in the East was out of the question. The question was how to exploit the victory. And the answer was not hard to see. For now, the central Russian armies lay within a huge bulge around Warsaw. Falkenhayn planned to encircle them from south and north. Russian soldiers fought with undiminished tenacity, and the bulk of them escaped the German pincers. It took the Germans 17 days to advance 25 miles to Lublin. But on August the 4th, the first anniversary of the war, they entered Warsaw. Russia's agony now began as the invaders swept forward. New hardships fell upon a population to whom hardship itself was nothing new. The self-control with which these poor people met their trouble made one's heart bleed. They had lost everything, but they never complained. The plight of the Russian armies was little better. Their shortage of equipment had now reached the level of catastrophe. The Russian chief of staff told the French ambassador, In several infantry regiments, at least one third of the men had no rifle. These poor devils had to wait patiently under a shower of shrapnel until their comrades fell before their eyes and they could pick up their arms. A Russian commander said, our army is drowning in its own blood. Falkenhayn seized the moment to put out peace feelers to the Tsar. Loyal as ever to his allies, Nicholas II rejected them. But the Tsar's warlike ambitions were drifting ever further apart from the wounds and griefs of his people. The French ambassador reported, Disorders in Moscow have been particularly serious. 
The agitation assumed such a scale that it had become necessary to suppress it by force. On the famous Red Square, the mob insulted the royal family, demanded that the Empress should be incarcerated in a convent, and the Emperor deposed. The Tsar took no notice. In September, he assumed personal command of the Russian armies, saying, We shall fulfill our sacred duty to defend our country to the last. We will not dishonor the Russian land. So the war would go on. Now the German armies in the north, under General von Hindenburg, struck eastwards, as they had long been waiting to do, and a melancholy roll call of place names signaled Russia's new disasters. Novogiorgievsk, Bialystok, Kovno, blazing Brest-Litovsk, one by one they fell to the advancing Germans. The Kaiser wrote in a letter my victorious sword has crushed the Russians. Woe to them that yet draw the sword against me. The furthest German advance was 300 miles. The Russians lost over 3,000 guns. Their losses in men have been estimated at over 2 million. Even the inexhaustible manpower of the Russian Empire could not stand this rate of loss. Russia faced collapse, and one question echoed again and again in Russian minds. What are our allies doing? The allies were doing their best, and they had received an important reinforcement. On May the 23rd, when the Battle of Gorlitsi Tarnov was three weeks old, Italy declared war on Austria. Italy went to war for territory to expand her frontiers. A secret treaty signed in London promised her the Trentino, the southern Tyrol, Istria, with the port of Trieste. The hope of liberating the large Italian populations under Austrian rule in these areas inspired and excited her. The Italian Prime Minister called this policy Sacro Egoismo, sacred egotism. So war reached out to lay its hand upon fresh landscapes. Silent mountains rumbled with new thunders. The stammer of machine guns was heard among the glaciers. Blood poured out and froze upon the snow. This style of war was something different. In the high Alps, every movement cost a prodigious effort. But this was the war of big guns. The effort had to be made. By marvels of patience, ingenuity and sheer hard work, the Italians prepared their attacks. The advantages were all with their enemies, in prepared positions along the heights. An Austrian officer said, The scenery was really marvelous. Just imagine on top of a 6,000 foot mountain, something which tourists come from far away to see. But from the mil military point of view, the position was marvelous. We saw everything that go went on. We saw every step, every tree uh, in front of us. And if the, we thought if the Italians should attack, it would, they can't get through. It was not against the Alpine barrier to the north that